All right, so while these, are, uh, these responses are coming in, it, it looks like uh, quite a few people have either handcrafted HTML and CSS applications. Uh, I'm not sure if they're single page applications uh, or just deploy straight up uh, Rails applications or all the logic on the server side. So uh, that's good. I, I hope you'll learn something new today about how my company, Pull Everywhere, which the, the product is what you're seeing. We're a software as a service company, uh, and we just sell this to presenters uh, based on audience size. So I'm going to fire up the slides here. All right. My display settings are working, so this is good. All right, so middleman, the missing view in the Rails API stack. Uh, let's just jump into it. So as I said before, I'm Brad Gessler, CTO and, and co-founder of Pull Everywhere. We started this company about six years ago now. So uh, we were mobile first whenever that meant SMS. Uh, so we've went through all the pains of having to uh, upgrade, if you will, to the second vintage of mobile first, which is uh, a mobile, uh, basically a mobile website. Uh, and we had a lot of fun doing that and, and learning things the hard way. But first... What is middleman? How many of you have heard of Jekyll in this room? That seems to be the, the predominant static website generator. And if you go to the Ruby toolbox and you ask Ruby toolbox for, hey, what should I use to generate a static website? You're going to get Jekyll. Um, but it's, it's not like Jekyll uh, in the sense that it uses a lot of the uh, more modern, uh, basically Ruby gems inside of what you see in, in Rails 4 and, and Rails 3, which is the fact that it uses tilt to manage all of the, uh, the templating and, and SAS and all that good stuff. So if you're looking for a tool to build a static site, don't be scared off by the fact that middleman is uh, catching up with Jekyll. And you should feel a lot better uh, about that after this talk. So middleman is extraordinarily well documented. Thomas Reynolds uh, built middleman. He's the, the, the guy behind this. And he also uh, built an amazing website with a lot of great documentation behind it. So if you go to, I believe it's uh, middlemanapp.com, you can get a sense of, of everything that, that this static site generator involves. Another really nice thing about this uh, static site generator is that it's, it's very modular. So it actually uses Rack in its gut. So if you understand Rack, you can write a lot of extensions using Rack, which is kind of crazy, uh, a static site generator using Rack uh, to, to do certain things. And there's also a an extension framework uh, where you can roll things out like a middleman blog, if you so please. So middleman blog and middleman is essentially a, a drop-in replacement for Jekyll uh, with a few other things. If you're used to writing GitHub-flavored markdown, there's a few tweaks that you have to make there to, to get that whole thing working. So getting started with middleman is actually very similar to what it's like getting started in a Rails application. You install the gem. You initialize the application. It creates all of this boilerplate code. Uh, you can see from this directory structure, you have your configuration file, uh, default index HTML herb. Uh, you get a layout file, and then you have all of your assets, style sheets, uh, and JavaScripts. And then you spin up the server, and it boots extremely fast. So in under a second, you can hit this uh, server, and things are just working. So the thing that I like a lot about middleman is that it's very easy to come into middleman from Rails. I said earlier that this uses tilt. So you can bring all the same gems and really the same tool set that you uh, hopefully have come to love inside of Rails into middleman and, and start using it without too much of a problem. So the other interesting thing about middleman is that it's, it's multi-environment aware. Uh, this is, I pulled this from a default middleman configuration from the boilerplate and simplified it a bit. But here you, you get an idea that in your development environment, you can put extensions in there and activate them, uh, like live reload. And you can pull these extensions off of that uh, directory uh, that is on the middleman website. And then your production environment in middleman is, is called your build environment. So uh, in there, you're going to activate certain extensions like minifying CSS, JavaScript, uh, having an asset hash so that you can basically hash your assets and do what you do in Rails where you, you uh, give your asset path a, uh, a hash in the path so that you can cache it. 
so once you have this configuration set up and your web pages and stuff are, are ready to go, you have to deploy it somehow. And this is another area where Middleman really shines is that deployments are incredibly easy. It's two steps easy. There's the build command, which takes all of these templates and files and whatnot, and it basically compiles out a bunch of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript files uh, into a build directory. And then the, the best part about it is getting that build directory up to your web server is as simple as rsync. Or if you want to throw back to the days of using Dreamweaver, you could use FTP to upload it. Uh, or STFTP if you're into the whole security thing. Uh, I developed a, a gem called Shart appropriately, hoping that it would make for an awkward IT conversation in some corporate environment, uh, where you can deploy your middleman website up to an S3 bucket, and you can actually set the headers that are going to be emitted uh, from that S3 bucket, uh, mostly caching headers on, on certain assets. So there's a ton of tools you can use, and there's a ton of deployment targets that you can choose from for middleman. If you do go the route of deploying to S3, it's an incredibly cheap way uh, to really run your website. You just pay a couple cents a month for a, a personal website. And it's also incredibly scalable whenever you're deploying to an S3 endpoint. So, yippee, you have a static website. You know, why should you care about middleman? How is this going to, to help you scale your application? Before I dive into that, it's really important to kind of understand the place that middleman will have uh, in, in this uh, spectrum of dynacism is, is what I call it. And it turns out dynacism is not actually a word, so I had to ignore the, the spell checker on this thing. Uh, and it looks something like this. So the graph that you saw earlier was actually a static web application. And if you access poleb.com slash Brad on your smartphone, that was another static web application. Uh, so that's a very dynamic application, though, uh, in that the chart has to move and animate and pull this data from the server in real time. Uh, and under uh, you know, a second, it has to get from all of your phones, be it it comes from SMS or your smartphone, and we have to get it up on that graph in a really short amount of time. So that is arguably a, a highly dynamic application. And we also have to make things really smooth and seem very fluid, uh, because that's just what you have to do uh, for presentations like this. So as we go down the dynacism spectrum, you have your GUI-oriented applications. Uh, so Google Spreadsheets, you're probably very familiar with that. Who hasn't used it? You're doing a lot of actions, a lot of very short actions, and you don't want to uh, build applications where you click a button and then you have to wait for a response to come back to a server. The, basically, the functions of the GUI are very tightly coupled uh, with what comes out of that. So we kind of start moving down into documented-oriented web apps, like an invoicing application or Basecamp, where you, can, you start to get into Rails territory, where Rails is it's kind of the sweet spot between these highly dynamic applications or these highly static applications. So moving down uh, into the blogging platform world, you may have something like Subtle or Posthaven that is uh, backed by MySQL, but for the most part, it's just storing uh, these documents in a, uh, a database server just for the convenience of administering many users in a multi-tenancy environment. And then you go on out, down into your personal blog, and maybe some of you have a GitHub site, maybe you're using Jekyll for that, uh, maybe you're using Middleman, all the way down to informational websites, like a mom and pop shop or Steve's Plumbing Services. Uh, if somebody wants to make a killing, go out there and sell these restaurants that have Flash websites sell them uh, on a middleman website so that we can get some HTML out there and have less flash on the internet. So where does middleman kind of fit into all of this? If you're working on a greenfield application, it's, it's pretty easy to get started right away. Kind of what you hear about doing today is you build your single page HTML application over here and you build your smaller kind of API off to the side using Sinatra or some type of, of micro framework. But since we've been around as a company for, well, since 2008, we actually started out using Rails 1.2, I believe. It was before REST uh, was even a thing in Rails. So uh, we have this Greenfield application. We spin this thing up. Uh, it was great. We were able to move pretty fast inside of this framework. Uh, and we just set up this application at plover.com. The real-time components we had, uh, I don't know if anybody remembers RJS, 
Uh, but that was basically how we would make things appear in, in real time on Rails, uh, was through these uh, kind of, in retrospect, horrendous helpers that would emit JavaScript from the server and run on your web page. So we got a lot of mileage out of that, and, but it wasn't, it wasn't really enough. We needed something that was more visually appealing than just updating some numbers on a table. So that's whenever we turn to Flex, because they happen to have this uh, bar chart library that everything updated in real time. There was just a lot of stuff that worked out of the box. And it also just happened, out of sheer dumb luck, that Flash was installed on 99 some odd percent of just all machines out on the internet. But even more compelling is that you could embed a Flash asset into a PowerPoint slide because of uh, good old ActiveX. So we did this kind of weird hack where we would embed these uh, Swifts that we would generate, uh, these Flex applications, and we would actually embed them into a PowerPoint slide and send those out up on a server so that people could download these polls embedded uh, right into PowerPoint slides. So whenever they opened it, Nothing really had to be loaded up uh, over the conference Wi-Fi connections in their slide. The Swift application would just connect out to our Rails app and start pulling data out of it. So we initially had this Flex application uh, in the same code repository as we did our Rails application. So as we started to build more customers, things became more complex, and we were able to afford a contractor who came in and just started shredding it on this Flex app and really making a lot of progress to the point where we started getting annoyed at just how many commit messages that he would have in our, I believe it was actually SVN at the time. Uh, so we broke that out into a, a separate application. And we were able to move a lot quicker And in the fact that we got to separate deployments. So we had this contractor working over here on the Flex app, and he was able to deploy those Swift assets out to production. And meanwhile, the Rails app team uh, was able to do their work and kind of uh, push their updates out through a separate release cycle. Uh, and of course, at the time, it was a lot easier for Flex to work with XML, so we had a very fashionable XML API. So time went on. Uh, mobile started to change. It wasn't just about SMS anymore. So we had to uh, think about the smartphone thing that was, that was taking off, really with the advent of the iPhone. So having a lot of really good luck in the past with frameworks, uh, including Rails and, and some of the visual components that Flex gave us, naturally we gravitated towards using jQuery mobile. Uh, and the other thing, .mobi extension, was this thing that I saw in Railscast about these, these newfangled uh, way to kind of say, hey, this .mobi format is going to serve up this, this mobile stuff that's kind of like HTML. So it turned out that was a really bad idea. Uh, the way that jQuery mobile worked got us about 80% of the way there, but the other 20% was just extraordinarily painful. The jQuery mobile framework was extremely opinionated. It wanted data in a certain way. It wanted the DOM to be structured a certain way. It felt kind of clunky, and we just felt like we were kind of stuck inside of the, the jQuery uh, mobile world. So our team had to, had to do some soul searching on this front. And what we decided at the time was, you know, instead of trying to pick a framework, let's actually focus at the specific problems that we're trying to solve, and let's focus on picking libraries. So that made our thinking a lot more clear, and we're able to pick exactly what we needed it, or yeah, pick exactly what we need, and bring it in our application where we needed it. So at the time as well, there was still a lot going on in the JavaScript MVC world. You had Sprout Core was, was one of the uh, frameworks that we looked at. And uh, that was not really that good looking in terms of uh, where we came from with jQuery Mobile. So we decided to go full speed ahead and, and use Backbone.js, which was, I think, at version 0.8 at the time. And we knew that we would probably be swapping out libraries because the space was still maturing very rapidly and there were a lot of changes. So this approach really let us hand pick the libraries we need and swap them out as something else kind of pulled ahead of, you know, another library. So we ended up with this uh, single-page mobile application that we built entirely inside of Middleman. So Middleman was handling all of the assets uh, that, that this application was using. And it uses kind of the standard uh, sprockets pipeline that, that you have in Rails. So whenever you build this thing, we have three files. We upload it to our Nginx server. And we were pretty happy with how this stuff 
uh, ends up working out uh, in production, especially for deployments. So if you go down this route of building these single page web applications, one thing that you need to be very aware of is cores. Uh, so whenever you went to the polev.com uh, single page site on your phone, that was actually making an AJAX request to our polleverywhere.com host uh, to an API endpoint on there. So in order to do that without cores, you'd get all these cross domain errors uh, for AJAX. But what cores lets you do is uh, the polev.com host says, hey, polleverywhere.com, I'm from a different domain. I want to make these types of HTTP requests, a GET request, a uh, POST request. And oh, by the way, I want access to these headers. So our polleverywhere.com server says, oh, OK, you're on our whitelist, polleverywhere.com. So here you go. Here's the data. Great, you want to post something. Uh, I'll accept that request. Uh, and if another domain uh, tried to access us, it would just give them the cross-domain error. So that's how we, we got around that issue. And then another really great thing about uh, the way that we deployed this mobile app is it's really easy to deploy this to a CDN. You actually have these assets that you can push out to other servers. Uh, so you can't really do that with a Rails app, per se. You can't just take it and stick it over here on this file system on this server without having to boot a bunch of stuff and uh, go through all that. So another interesting kind of feature of that is that you can deploy to floppy disks. So when's the last time anybody's seen one of these? <laughs> and uh, we have these readers here. You can pick these up for about 15 bucks off of Amazon. And what I'm actually going to do is a live hardware demo, possibly the only one at RailsConf. And let's plug this in. The really surprising thing to me was that Mac OS actually recognizes floppy drives. So let's plug this guy in here. Oop. Devices. I think that's devices. Oh, I got to put the disk in. All right. So you can hear the hear the disk spinning. Uh, let's see. There it is. Boy, that's hard to see up here. All right, so here's the application. We'll just launch this. <laughs> so hopefully your network connection is faster than a, a floppy disk, but if you have a customer living somewhere remote and the only way to get something to them is by Pony Express, you can just put this floppy disk in a satchel and, and send the pony on its way. The really fun thing is opening Network Inspector on this and seeing how Chrome measures this. Is it latency or is the file really taking that long to load? So here you go. You just saw a web application booted from a floppy disk. I can go to my pull out page and submit a vote. So we joke about uh, coming up with the floppy JS library uh, because if you can see the inspector down there, I don't know if, if it shows, but the retina assets aren't loaded. Those were too big to fit on this floppy disk. So <laughs> we came up with some fun ideas to span our JavaScript across floppy disks. But we had better things to do, like fix bugs in production. So great, you can put this on floppy disks, but I think more importantly there is you can put them inside of PhoneGap or Cordova apps, um, or we have some customers that they want to bundle our voting application with one of their mobile applications. So we can say, here's our HTML assets. You can put them within your application, and then whenever there's 300 people sitting in a conference room, it won't overload the Wi-Fi. So caching aside, there's, there's another component to this. Uh, Flex, Flex started getting old. It started getting outdated. The writing was on the wall that this stuff was going to die. So whenever we set out to write our visualization app, it was very natural for us to think, oh, you know what? Let's use middleman. We want this thing to work on tablets, iPhones, and everywhere. So naturally, we're going to use, oh, what do they call it today, HTML5. Let's use that. 
let's use that HTML5 thing to talk to our JSON API. And that worked great. We got this application out there. It's actually what you saw today is, is that HTML5 application. We have all the benefits of caching and the CDN and whatnot. Uh, but, but something came up. Whenever we were looking at these visualizations day in and day out, we thought, geez, those, these feel really slow. Uh, because we were using short polling. We were hitting our server once every couple of seconds to get the new data from our server to, to update on the, the graph. So we decided we wanted to do better than that. We rolled out a stream API. Um, we actually wrote our own server at the time because socket IO wasn't quite what we wanted. Uh, I, I actually gave a talk in 2012 about this, um, about streaming resources. So we threw up that streaming API server, but there were some problems with it. Back in 2012 when I gave that talk, uh, we were using AMQP on the back end of this thing. And there were just a lot of stability issues with that. It wasn't quite working with the, with the grain of the, the web and how resources work and, and how caching and all that stuff works. So we had these stability issues that, that we were trying to deal with. And what was really nice about having these client-side applications is we were able to spit up our, our stream server and its own host, its own completely different host, and isolate it. Our team had a lot of learning to do to understand how to not only build these real-time web applications, but how to operate them, how to scale them. So whenever we rolled this thing out, we'd have crashes, and our client-side application was able to seamlessly basically fail over to uh, HTTP short pulling. So over time, our team got much better at just kind of managing all these pieces. Um, and uh, we had client-side uh, SOA going on there. So you can also, with cores, if there's several APIs that you have out there, you can consume those from your uh, JavaScript and kind of munge all that stuff together client-side and just do uh, whatever it is that you please with that data. So we had so much success uh, with all these middleman, these single-page middleman applications that we started to build all of our other applications in these. So our approach towards native integrations has been Basically, let's build a special web browser that has these certain hooks into JavaScript so that our web developers can, can be more productive and interact more with uh, basically the, the native application. So we can control a lot of uh, different things with these integrations from JavaScript. So we start having all these backbone applications pop up. Now, if you've dealt with several applications, you may be thinking, geez, you know, you're probably repeating yourself with a lot of different things. So how do you get a handle on this stuff uh, in this world of uh, sprockets and middleman? So what we did is we took all of kind of the common components of this, the session components, uh, the models and, and backbone. We pulled all these into this one asset gem that then everything uh, consumes from there. So to make those gems, it's just like making any other gem, uh, you just say, bundler, gem, and then whatever the name is of your gem. Here we have pull of assets. And the kind of different thing about this gem is that you check if sprockets is there. And if it is, then you start appending all these paths to where the assets in your asset gem lives. So uh, for example, in our lib assets uh, JavaScript's gem, we have a user uh, backbone model. We have a pull backbone model. The style sheets, uh, we actually use font icons everywhere um, so that we can fit all this stuff on a floppy drive. Um, so we can have all these assets located here, which whenever all the other applications consume that, they can have a consistent look and feel that uses kind of the visual language uh, that we want to use throughout all of our uh, applications on all the different platforms. And of course, you have your vendor JavaScript assets. So if you have four different projects out there, you're probably using four different versions of jQuery. This lets us use one version of jQuery and one version of Backbone. The way that we manage these uh, in our development environment is just through Bundler. So you can imagine if you have one version of jQuery, well, what happens whenever you bump from the 1.x to 2.x? You're probably going to break a lot of stuff. Uh, but we actually don't have that problem, because like with Ruby gems, you don't really care if there's an upgrade happening. What you care about is that you're getting the version that you asked for in your uh, gem bundle. So we're able to control that by pushing our pull of assets up to a uh, basically a Git repository, and we reference that from this gem file. You don't actually see the, the Git reference in there, but you can see that uh, in this case we're saying, hey, 
I want to use the new feature branch of Polev assets. The assets path uh, thing above that is a nice little hack so that if you're making changes to the Polev assets uh, project, you can pull those in locally so that you don't have to run bundle update every time. Uh, and what's cool about middleman is if you're developing these pull-up assets locally, whenever you reload middleman, it actually picks up uh, the changes from the, the assets gem. You don't have to reboot the server or uh, do anything crazy like that. So the way that we can build new features now, let's say that, let's say the worst case scenario, I have to build a new API to support a new feature. I can branch my Rails app project and I can say, hey, branching this off, it's called new feature. Um, I'm going to add some kind of new visualization to it that needs a new API. So I can build that API out on my server, I can develop that locally, and I can point my middleman project at my local server. And I can branch it in here, and I can branch pull of assets, and basically have three different branches, or sorry, one branch and three different repos, uh, all working on the same feature. And then whenever I go to deploy, obviously I deploy the API uh, server functionality first, and then I would go on to roll out these uh, middleman single page websites. So does it work? I think so, it's, it's worked really well for us. Uh, we have to deal with some weird kind of bandwidth constrained environments where you can't trust conference Wi-Fi connections. Um, and it also, I realized that it worked really well for us when about two months ago, Microsoft wanted to launch their uh, PowerPoint 2013 store inside of the uh, Microsoft Office application. So they actually have an app store inside of there. And we were able to pull a bunch of assets from our mobile application into our Sprockets asset gem and reuse all of that stuff, most of it, in the PowerPoint 2013 app. And then we were able to quickly make some customizations to that whole user experience to make it fit in with Office 2013 a little bit better. And of course, when you're running a single page JavaScript application inside of this little web iframe, essentially in Office, it feels very close, it feels very native. Uh, so that, that worked pretty well for us. But I think even better than that, than reusing functionality is, inevitably, whenever you work on one of these projects, you make some kind of improvement. Something just feels better about maybe handling a login or some kind of status code or something. So these improvements that we make in these individual projects we're able to pull them back into the Sprockets asset gem and then push them back out to all of our other projects. So all these other projects you see up here benefit from the PowerPoint 2013 app and uh, that just keep kind of reinforces itself, reinforcing itself. So in a sense, the Sprockets asset gem turns into this little perfect little framework uh, for your organization that's extracted in the right way where it's, it's being extracted from stuff that's actually being used and being proven as successful by customers. So that's a pretty good overview of one of the more complex uh, middleman deployments, I would say, is out there and just managing kind of multiple projects. One of the downsides and also plus sides of middleman is that there's no out-of-the-box JavaScript MVC app uh, solution in there. So uh, in the case of Backbone, it's up to you to organize all the assets in some way that, that makes sense. Uh, and different JavaScript frameworks have, some are more organized than others, so that's both a blessing and a curse. Uh, it worked out for us because there really wasn't a framework, so we kind of came up with our own, and we didn't have to deal with, with somebody else's uh, bad framework. So that was the overview of the highly dynamic website, which has all these static applications stashed everywhere. What about static websites? The other side of the uh, kind of token where Rails fills the middle ground. So we're developing a lot of content for, for our website. There's an explosion of use cases and all sorts of stuff that we have to implement. So one thing that we'll probably do on this front is extract out a content directory from Rails app. How many of you have, uh, in your Rails app, it starts out, you have kind of the home page, and then it turns into this directory called content, and then you have all these content pages. Maybe you end up with 20 or 30 of them one day, and before you notice this big junk drawer of content, and you have to look in your routes file and kind of make sense of all this stuff. So in middleman, you don't, the, the directory structure is the routing structure, so that stuff checks out a lot nicer. It's just much easier to handle this content. 
And there's also uh, much better support in there for uh, different things like image compression. You can ping crush everything. So if you have designers uh, building image assets and they don't understand the technicalities of making pings uh, much smaller, middleman can take care of that in its asset pipeline. Uh, and of course, on a uh, static website like that, you still have some dynamic components. You can't just throw a static website out there uh, and ex just tell everybody, like, oh, no, you know, forget about login state. There's some common things that people want to see, so you can take care of that uh, with JavaScript, and you can run all that stuff client-side. So you can have some really lightweight JS that checks with the server. Maybe it checks for the presence of a cookie to see if, uh, if the user's logged in or not. And then, of course, if you have a contact us form or anything like that, you would test these uh, integration points uh, with Rails so that whenever somebody types in some stuff into a form and submits it, it hits your Rails app, and hopefully it doesn't blow up. And of course, you have other JavaScript applications like uh, Google Analytics, Optimizely, Stripe, all these little javascript -y tools that you can uh, throw in there. And uh, you know, it makes it a little more dynamic. So the nice thing about a static website is that you can't get taken down that easily, especially if you have this stuff up in an S3 bucket or stashed in CDNs. Uh, I was at a middleman meetup about a year ago, and the, the folks from nest.com were there. And they said they were using some CMS or some, some dynamic backend, and they kept being mentioned in the press, and their website kept getting really slow. So they looked at a few things, and uh, I think one option involved just throwing hardware at the problem. Uh, and they decided that was insane. Let's just build a static website with middleman and push this stuff out there on a really simple server. And they no, no longer had any of these problems where their site would get taken down from a, an influx of, of traffic. So there's a lot of things to think about whenever you're uh, building these middleman applications. I could probably give another two or three talks just on these items alone. Uh, if you want to ask me questions about this stuff later, um, but I don't have time to cover that now. And of course, I encourage you to get out there, build your next website with middleman, even if it's a personal website or a blog or something, try it out. Uh, if you're working on single uh, web page applications, you could take your handcrafted stuff and throw it into middleman and start using that and start using the asset pipeline. A lot of these ideas uh, that I talked about today and some of the things I didn't talk about, um, our company, Pull Everywhere, is actually extracting out this framework and we're going to be releasing these bits into Git Fanny Pack, or Fanny Pack is going to be the name of this, this kind of framework that uses middleman and deals with stuff like testing, binding to different environments, uh, and all that stuff. And of course, if you want to work on this stuff every day and get paid for it, you can join our team at Pull Everywhere. So that's my talk. I'm Brad Gessler. I'll be posting slides, links, and, and code uh, up on Twitter whenever uh, I'm not working on these slides. Thanks.